Hey guys, Mark here. I hope you're doing well. In today's video, I'm going to show you a project that I've really been looking forward to. This is the 4 byte Paracord Cross. This project was on my to-do list for quite a while now, but it took considerable time, effort, patience, modification, filming and editing, so it's only now that I'm able to bring you this tutorial. All in all, it is a great looking way of creating a cross either for a decoration or as a keychain for example. With this said, let me show you the cross up close, its variations, then let's make our own. Here you can see an example of a 4 byte cross. We call it such because it has 4 bytes on the sides, at the top and at the bottom. This is a 2 pass version, meaning that it has 2 strands running through the entire knot. You can make it for example with 550 paracord as a decorative cross or in a smaller version for example using type 1 paracord. Type 1 paracord is a lot smaller so the cross is also quite compact. As you can see I added a small loop on this smaller version for it to function as a keychain. Now I have also tested a single pass version of the cross either with a cord or without one. But I much prefer the look of the two pass version. As you can see, both the larger cross and the smaller one have cores inside them, meaning two sticks that keep the shape of the cross. Let's move on to the supplies needed for the cross and then finally to the tying process. The first supply that you're going to need to make this cross is a tying tool. Also referred to as a mandrel, this tool is what we tie our knot onto, then we transfer it onto a core. I'm going to show you how to make this tool in my next segment, but for now, this is a 1 inch dowel rod. This one is a half inch dowel rod. They are connected through a hole in the one inch dowel rod and a nail is used to hold everything in place. As I've mentioned, I'm going to show you how to do this in my next segment. I use this tool for my larger crosses made with 550 paracord as well as for the smaller versions made using type 1 paracord. So this is a universal tool that I use for all of my crosses. Now besides the mandrel you're also going to need a rubber band which is going to be used at the bottom of the mandrel in order to hold one end of your cord. The second supply that you're going to need is cordage. The type of cordage that you're going to be using really depends on your project. For example, for this one here, I used 550 paracord. For this one, I used type 1 paracord. It really depends on the size of the project that you would like to do. 
In either case though, so in the larger cross or in the smaller one, I used about 19 feet of cord for a two-pass version of the cross. The amount of cordage that you use up is defined by the mandrel, not the size of the cross. The next supply is a lacing needle. These come in a variety of sizes and shapes. A lacing needle is not absolutely required, but it makes tying the knot easier and more comfortable. So I do recommend it. You're going to need a dowel rod or a stick for the core of the cross. We're going to cut that dowel rod into two pieces and cross them to get the core. Now, for our cross, we're going to use a dowel rod about 3 eighths of an inch in diameter. That is about a centimeter. A smaller project like this would require something much thinner. You're also going to need a knife of some sort for carving the core. Finally, you're going to need something to cut the ends of your paracord and a lighter to melt the ends that we cut. Let's now move on to making the tying tool. To make our tying tool or mandrel, we're first going to cut the main part. So this is A 1 inch mandrel. And I'm going to cut about half a foot or 15 centimeters. The other part of my tying tool or mandrel is going to be about half an inch in diameter, so about 12 millimeters. The length is going to be about 4 inches or 10 centimeters. Continue by sanding both parts of your mandrel down to make it easier to the touch and prevent any splinters. Next, I'm going to drill a hole through the main part of my mandrel so that I can push the half inch part through it. This is going to create a cross. I'm going to mark about 2 inches away from the edge like this. So this is going to be the spot where I'm going to drill. So 2 inches away from the edge. For the drill bit I'm using one designed specifically for working with wood. As you can see it has a spiked tip which makes it easy to pinpoint the exact drilling location. Now the diameter of the drill bit should be slightly larger than this part which we're going to push through the hole. So this is a half an inch part 
so half an inch in diameter, so the diameter of the drill bit needs to be a bit bigger than half an inch. In my case, about 9 sixteenths of an inch or 14 millimeters. So we now have a functional cross that's going to serve as our tying tool. One little upgrade that you can do is to fixate this horizontal part of the tool. At the moment, it moves around a little bit. To stop this, you drill a hole through the center here, and then you place either a nail or a screw with a nut through it to secure it. After drilling a hole, I'm going to fit a nail through the hole. At the bottom, I'm going to clip off this sharp bit, like this. And finally, I'm going to sand off any sharp edges remaining on the nail. We now have our tying tool ready to be used. At the bottom of my cross, I placed a rubber band. Under this rubber band, I'm going to place one end of my cord. Like this. The other end sports a lacing needle, which is going to help me tie my knot. We are now ready to begin tying. I have broken down the tying process into four more manageable steps. Each step is going to add one byte in our cross. Now this tying process, even though I have made it as simple as I can, can still be something that you need to redo a few times to get the proper result. I had to retie my cross several times before I was able to complete it. So don't give up on your first take. Take some time, learn, get used to it, and you're going to do just fine. Let's begin. Step 1 in tying our cross is very simple. We take our cord and we wrap it around this vertical part of the cross. Like this. We then continue wrapping around the right part. Like this. And we travel under this cord using our working hand. We then wrap around this top part, like this, and again, we're going to pass under this part or cord. Like this. And finally, we're going to wrap around this left part of the cross, like this. Then take your working hand and pass under this part here, like this. 
If you did this correctly, you have a diamond shape here at the center. Continue. After your under, with three overs. So over, over, and over. And this is step one of tying our cross. We can now begin step two of tying our cross. We finished our previous step by going over the standing hand. We're now going to turn back towards the top, going parallel to the standing hand, and over two, so over this chord, then over this chord, and under this one. Like this. Basically, we ended up on the back side of the cross. At the front, we have this diamond pattern, and we're going to repeat it on the back side. So to do this, take your cord, wrap it around the right part, then travel over one, under two, here to the top. Like this. So over one, under two. Wrap around the top. Like this. Take your working hand. And pass over one, under two. Here to the left side. Like this. So we again went over one, under two. Wrap around the left part. Like this. Pick up your working hand. And we're now going to start a sequence of splitting pairs. We're going to start over one, over this chord. Then under, to split these two chords. Then over, to split these two chords. Like this. And at this point, you get the diamond pattern at the back side of the cross as well. Continue. Going under this chord. So under. Then over. Under. And finally over on the bottom. Like this. We can now begin step 3. So this step, so step 2, established another diamond pattern at the back of the cross and basically tied a 2 byte paracord cross. We finished step 2. Traveling over one at the bottom, which got us here right next to the standing end. We're now going to follow the standing end, traveling parallel to the standing end 
on its left side. So we first go under this chord. So just like the standing end. Then over the next chord, just like the standing end. Then under. So again, just like the standing end. Then over, again, just like the standing end. Then, we continue traveling under this chord here. Like this, then over this chord here on the right. What we're going to do now is wrap around like this, effectively traveling over this bite, then under two, like this, over one, under one, over this chord, and under at the top of the cross. Like this. So we went over one, under two, over one, under one, over one, and under one. We're now going to turn towards the left side, taking our working hand, and since we came out under this bite, we're going to start our next sequence under this bite. So we start under over under two and over one here on the left. So we went under one, over one, under two, and over one. Now we're going to take our working hand, and since we passed over this bite, we're going to travel to the next one, basically wrapping around, and going over this chord, then under two, under these two chords, here, and you can see that I'm traveling in between these two parallel chords. So I went over this chord, under these two, then I continue over, under, then over two, over this chord and this chord, so over two, then under one, over two,
under one and over one. And this is step three. This was probably the hardest one out of them, since it requires some attention and making sure that you exit at one byte, so let's say this one, then re-enter at the next one. You need to do that at the right side, top side and left side. We are now at our final fourth step. In this step, we are mostly going to travel in between two parallel chords and split them. So we're going to travel between them and do the opposite. We finished the previous step with an over one coming to the left side of the standing hand. We're going to travel in between the standing hand and the chord to its left. We're going to start our sequence with an over one, then under one. Like this. So over under. Continue over two, under one, then over two, and under this chord, like this. Then Travel alongside the standing hand, traveling under the next chord as well. So effectively, we went under two. Then continue over, under, exiting on the right side. So we exit under this byte and then we re-enter at the next one, which is basically two parallel chords going towards the top. We start our sequence over one, under one, Over one, under two, then continue, over one, under one. We exit under this byte. So we're going to re-enter at the next one. We start off over one, then continue under one, again splitting two parallel chords. Then continue over this chord, under the next one, then over and under this chord, then follow this chord, traveling parallel to it, under this chord as well. So effectively we went under two, 
then continue over and under. We are now at our final pass. The final pass is going to split a pair of parallel chords, so the sequence is going to be a simple over one, under one. So we exit under this byte, and we re-enter at the next one. We start over, then under, as you can see, splitting these two chords. Continue over, under, over, under, over, under, Over, under, over, under, and over. At this point, we come to the standing hand, and we place our working hand alongside the standing hand. And with this, we have tied a 4 byte paracord cross. Congratulations, not many come this far. We're now going to continue with the doubling process, then transform this one into a proper cross. After tying your cross, the next step is usually to double it up. Now, if you tied your cross fairly tightly, you may want to loosen it up a bit before you begin doubling it up. This just makes your job a bit easier. To loosen up your knot, you work in a bit of your working hand back into the knot And you distribute this slack all throughout the knot until you come out at the standing end. At that point, you should have used up all of this slack. If the knot is loose enough, you can begin doubling it up. Now, I have already loosened up this knot so I can begin my doubling process. We start by taking our working hand, which is passing under here, right next to the standing hand. We then simply follow or chase the standing hand all through the knot until we reach the standing hand once again. So here, we continue with an over, then under. Like this, you can see that we are doubling up the knot. Continue following the standing hand until you reach it again. So over under, over under, and so on. We always do an over one under one sequence. We always make sure 
that both of our strands are neatly lined up. Keep doubling up your knot and then we're going to continue. After doubling up your knot, your working end should come under this section right next to the standing end. At this point, we're going to begin preparing our knot so that we can transfer it onto a core. A core is basically Two sticks crossed, which gives your knot some support and structure. First off, we're going to remove this rubber band. We're going to take some pliers and to remove the nail that's holding our mandrel together. Then, what we're going to do is remove the two sticks out of the knot. Like this. Now, what we're going to do is take our working hand, place it over one, then into the knot, and work it out at the top of the knot. Like this. Now at this point, you could finish the setup of your working hand here. This is fine if you're going to do a cross like this. If you want a loop, like in a keychain, then feed your working hand through the knot to the bottom, and this creates a loop. In my case, I'm not going to be needing a loop, so I'm going to leave it like this. You can see that we have three cords here. This is not something that is consistent with the rest of our knot. So I'm going to pull the standing end out. Like this. Then work it here. So into this opening. And out at the bottom. Like this. At this point, we have prepared our knot. We have the two ends on the sides of the knot, which makes them easier to trim once we have tightened up our knot. At this point, we need to prepare a core for our cross. I use a core in smaller projects such as keychains or larger projects such as decorative crosses. To do a cord, we're going to need two sticks or dowel rods which go through the knot like this at a right angle. Now the size for this horizontal section, in my case, is going to be about two and a half inches. This vertical section is going to be three and a half inches long. This is for this specific project, so a two-pass 
cross done using 550 paracord. So we're going to need two stacks for the core of our cross. Now in the local hardware store, you can find a variety of dowel rods of different diameters. So for a smaller project, you would use a thin dowel rod. For something larger, such as our project here, you would use something like 3 eighths of an inch dowel rod. Now you don't have to go to the hardware store for this, you can simply go outside, pick out a few sticks from the local tree or bush and craft them into shape. In my opinion, the worst style of a core is just two round sticks placed together. This is a bit too bulky. This is why I will usually carve some sort of a notch. The first style of a notch that I would like to show you is the round notch. The round notch is made onto one piece of a stick or dowel rod. Then the other stick or dowel rod is going to sit in this notch. This holds this piece in place. To carve a notch like this, all you need is a knife and you slowly carve out a round notch. Now when you're carving, it is important that you carve the wood and not yourself. So always carve away from you. I have now carved a round notch into this piece of a dowel rod. I'm now going to place the other piece into the notch and this notch is going to hold it in place. This is a nice way of connecting two dowel rods, but it has a specific look to it. Since we place one stick into the notch, this part, in my case the horizontal part, is going to be a bit raised. You can see this for example in this keychain. So this horizontal part is a bit raised. If you like this effect, use the round notch. The other style of a notch, which I actually prefer in most cases, is the square notch. This one is done by first using your saw and marking down the edges of your notch. Then you take your knife and you pop this part in between the two saw marks out. Like this. You then need to straighten it out a little bit and what you get is a square shaped notch. So once you have done one square notch to about the middle point of your stick or dowel rod, you take the other one as well and you do the exact same thing.
after you carve out two notches, so one on the vertical stack or dowel rod and one on the horizontal one, you simply bring them together and they interlock into a secure core. I very much prefer this way of creating a core over any other. After building our core, we're going to place it into the knot, then start tightening. So we're going to build our core by feeding the two parts into the knot Like this, and we now begin tightening. We start by pulling in our standing end a little bit, just so that we know where it is. Then, start removing slack by pulling it through the knot and out the working end. So we need to go through the entire knot and get the slack out. Now the tightening process is quite time consuming. Usually I'm going to run my slack out out of the knot at least three times. So I'm going to repeat my tightening three times or more to get a nice looking knot. So this does take a while. It's nothing too advanced, but it does take its time. Finally, I have tightened up my cross. I needed three full tightenings from the standing end all through the knot and the slack came out out the working end. So this is the final result. I'm now going to trim my end like this. And, if needed, you can push this part so the trimmed end back under the cross. Like this. One additional technique that I employ is to roll my knot. Now the cross is a bit specific when it comes to rolling, so let me show you. First, I take a plank, which I'm going to use to press down on the knot. I'm going to place my knot on the edge of the table, then roll it. Then I'm going to turn it around and also roll the top part. And then the sides. You keep doing this until you get the look for your knot that you would like. Rolling your knot basically flattens it out. At this point I have rolled the knot. You can see that the strands in the knot 
Lay flatter, giving your cross a more uniform look. It is especially important that you roll here at the transition between the vertical part and the horizontal part. To better define this angle here, roll this part and this one to get a sharp angle. So this is just a tip in getting a better look for your cross. Guys, I would like to thank you very much for joining me in this tutorial. It's not the easiest one out there and I hope that I was able to demonstrate it clearly. With that said, thank you and I hope to see you next time.